Hello and welcome back to some more videos on copulas. Now I know I said last time was a grand finale but it occurred to me that I'd mentioned a lot about how easy it was to do copulas in R and I'd not actually described how to do copulas in R and there are resources around there um, but I thought it might still be useful for some people to uh, see how I go about using copulas in R in terms of fitting copulas, in terms of calculating probabilities using copulas and, and simulations as well. So what I'm going to do this time is just run through the code that I'd use if I was going to try to work with copulas in R. Now I've covered some of this stuff in other videos that I've done but I think it's still worth doing it here because there's people who will just have joined us because you know, it's copulas and people like copulas and why wouldn't you? So they might not have seen the credit related videos where I talk about um, how to use R, how to install it, how to set it up and so on and so forth. So just first a little bit about R and what it is. It's a statistical program which is free to use, which is, which is nice. Um, it's particularly powerful in terms of matrix operations. So if you're combining data and you've got a choice as to whether to do it as a matrix or something else, try and do it as a matrix because in terms of multiplication, addition, other matrix operations, it's really quick. It's less quick if it has to process loops. So I, I do use loops sometimes. There's no easy alternative, but it, it adds to the processing time. And if you're working with a lot of data, this does become uh, important. Um, th there's also a very large community that produce and create specialist packages that you can use, which you can then load in as libraries. So if you've got some obscure statistical uh, problem that you're trying to deal with, the, the chances are you're not the first person, and the chances are that someone's written a package that you can do it easily uh, in, in R. Not always, but um, very frequently. So uh, it's very useful in that way. There's a very large community supporting the development of R. Um, there's a link here where you can download it, uh, the uh, uh, cranrproject.org. Uh, um, and I tend to run it through a program called RStudio, which I find is useful because it allows you to have the file that you're working in on the same desktop in the same space as the code that you're running and a window to show any charts that you're using. So it's quite a nice, easy way to manage any R projects that you're doing. And, and there's a download link for it here as well. And if, and if you work on your own, uh, rather than trying to work with a group of people, RStudio is also free to use. So it's helpful to put R code in a file so it can be rerun. If you want, you can just type commands into the command line in R. But if you've got a lot of code and you want to run it more than once, that would mean typing what you're doing several times. So it's easier to create a file and type code into the file. And then if you want to rerun it, you just highlight the code that you want to use um, and hit Control R and it runs the code again. Now, in these files, the first few lines are typically the ones which load the libraries that you're going to use. And these are things which you must first install as packages. So to, to install something as a package, you go to Tools, Install Packages, and then there's a huge list of potential packages. So, so you, it's good to know the name of the package that you want to use, type that in, install it, and you're all set. And then you can load it into your workspace by typing Library, open brackets, and then the name of the package. It's also important or, or helpful to set the working directory. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. One is it means that when you're saving your files, you're saving your work, you're saving into a place that you can access easily. Where, and it's not just into a central directory where all of your R work is stored. So if you've got a particular project you're working on, then set that as the working directory. It also means it's easier to import data because if you're trying to import a file, the first place it'll look is your working directory. So if you've got everything together in this working directory, it just makes life much easier. You don't have to type in uh, long directory names to, to get to where you're going to. You just set it as a working directory and, and you're all set. So what packages do we need to use? The main one is the package copula, fairly self-explanatory. Uh, another one which I 
tend to use is uh, XLSX, and this is useful because it allows us to import data from spreadsheets. We can also save data back to spreadsheets, which I, I don't do in these tutorials here, but um, it'll become pretty clear um, how, you, how you do that, and it's, it's fairly easy to look up how to do that. Another package which I use is called MASS, and this is useful if you're working with univariate distributions. So, although this is about copulas, um, when you're working with copulas, you're probably doing so because you've got some data which is, although linked by a copula, it, its univariate margins are described by some other distribution. And then the MASS package allows you to um, work with these univariate distributions and the probabilities which come out of the copula. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll see how that works later on. So, for these packages, um, just type library um, brackets, the package name, close brackets, um, stick them in, a, in the file as the first few lines, highlight, and then press Control enter and that runs the selected code. Now, what I've done also is I created a summary of weekly returns for six asset classes and I put them in a workbook which has the name return summary dot xlsx. I'm not the most creative when it comes to naming my workbooks, but you know, it's it's a name. Uh, the, the data is on the first worksheet. Now the sheet name doesn't matter, it's just the number of the sheet, so whether it's the first, second, third, and so on. And I put the workbook uh, in the working directory so, so it's easy to find. Um, and then what I do is I import the data from the first sheet in this, this name workbook and then display the results. Um, and the way that I do this is I create uh, something called ret sum return summary. I told you I wasn't very good with workbook names. And I put into that, that's what the uh, arrow on the line means, the output from this command, read.xlsx, then in brackets, um, return summary.xlsx in quotes, that's the workbook name, comma one, because it's the first sheet. And then just typing ret sum again, that means it shows the results. So I can just validate, verify that I've imported what I wanted to import. So in our studio, this is how it looks. The file is the uh, top left window, so I've got those three library commands, and then because I try to be good and put quotes in to describe what I'm doing, I've said that I'm reading and printing out the data from Excel, and then the two lines that uh, we had on the last slide. And then bottom right shows how this looks when you run it. So all of the, the blue lines there, that's code which has been run, and then after um, the line ret sum, it shows you the first few lines here of the workbook, which reassuringly has the same numbers as the workbook. So we've got this data frame, um, and we then need to get from this empirical distribution functions. So as you saw there, we've got a whole load of returns. Um, the returns are the marginal distributions, but as you'll remember, when you're looking at a copula, what you're working with is something which has the univariate distributions stripped out, so it has it converted to a uniform distribution. So, so what we need to do is we need to create those uniform distributions from the original data. Now there's a few ways of doing this in terms of how to code it, and there's a few ways of creating the uniform distribution as well. The, the way that I do it is I first create a new data frame which has the same size as the original in terms of the same number of rows and the same number of columns because that's what I that's what I want to have in terms of the size of my new data frame. So rather than create it from scratch, I'll just say, well, I'll copy in the old data and I'll just overwrite it. So this new data frame is called ret sum u, u for uniform. And then I need to fill it with the uh, empirical distributions that I'm going to create. So you know earlier I said um, it's not a good idea to use loops. Well, here's a loop. And the way that you create this loop, so this is a loop which is running from 1 to 6, and the reason I'm doing that is because I am going to do this separately for each of the six columns in the original data frame. So I say 4, then in brackets, i in 1 to 6. So that means take this variable i and loop through where i is 1, i is 2, and so on up to 6. And then what I actually wanted to do when I is looping through is what I put inside those curly brackets. So what I then do is have this thing called ret sum u, the data frame, 
then in square brackets blank comma i so uh, the blank means I do it for all the rows the i means I do it for the ith column so when you're trying to specify a cell in a matrix in R or a data frame in R you put it uh, the name of the data frame and then in square brackets you have the row that you want a comma and then the column that you want and we want this to apply to all of the rows so we just leave that blank comma and then we want to apply it to the ith column so initially the first column all the way up to the sixth column and what do we want to put in that first column well we want to have the rank of the uh, original data frame uh, which is ret sum and then the ith column from that and you can specify a ties method so if you've got two values which are exactly the same how do you deal with that and the method I've chosen here is random so it'll just randomly decide if you have two the same which comes first and which comes second um, so I take those ranks and then I divide it by the length of ret sum blank comma i so the 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 length of that vector the length of that column data the, the length is the number of items I've got in that column so what I'm essentially doing is I'm taking the rank and dividing it by n plus 1 so why do I divide it by n plus 1 if I look at the ranks and I divide them by n I'll get numbers which run from 1 over n all the way up to 1 now 1 implies 100% probability which you can't have so there's a couple of ways of dealing with it. The approach I use is I just divide by n plus 1. And what that means is my smallest number, my smallest probability, will be 1 over n plus 1. And my largest probability will be n over n plus 1. So everything is nicely bounded between 0 and 1 without actually reaching 0 and 1. The next thing I do is I um, use ret sum u and I convert it into a matrix. Now this is important for some uh, things in R. Th there are some things that you can do with a data frame. There are some things where the data needs to be in a matrix form. Um, they might look the same. I mean they do look very similar. Um, but it's just creating a particular type of data is sometimes necessary to get R to run a particular function. So I take ret sum u and I create a data matrix and I just stick it back into the same data name so I'm essentially overwriting the data frame with a matrix and then ret sum u I just run it so we can see what the results look like so again top left is how the code looks in R when I type it out and bottom right is how the code actually looks when it's run again all the blue lines there show you what's happening the final one ret sum u and all of these returns are now replaced with empirical distribution functions which if you look at the whole uh, data set you'll see everything is running from something which is greater than zero and less than one so you've got yourself there some nice uniform distributions which you can use to fit your data so let's first try and fit an Archimedean copula um, and I've chosen a Gumbel copula here and I'm going to just use three of the columns to fit a three-dimensional Gumbel copula. If I'm going to do this I need to create an object which has the required dimensions so there's nothing actually going to be in this object it's just saying this is uh, an object which has a the, the form of a three-dimensional Gumbel copula and I want you to to use this as almost like the the, the framework that you then fit the data to when you create a Gumbel copula object. So create this Gumbel copula object which I've called Gumbel object and we use that using the function Gumbel copula and we the option that we give it is in those brackets there dim equals three so three dimensions and then we use the uh, code fit copula and we say fit copula Gumbel object so that tells you what type of um, copula it uh, is going to fit using the data ret sum u um, all of the rows so before the comma is blank and then columns two to four two colon four means take the second third and fourth column and the method in this case is going to be maximum likelihood so method equals ml because there's a range of ways that you can do this and then 
Again, we look at the results, fitted, gumbel, ML, just type that out again, and that shows you the results. You can also do the same using Kendall's Tau or Spearman's Row. Now, we looked before at how to actually fit a copula um, using Kendall's Tau in, in previous, uh, previous videos. So this shows how you can just do it easily in R as well, and again, display the results. And you can also use the function of summary to give you additional uh, information. So what I do is I run all of these using um, the uh, Kendall's Tau, that's method I Tau, iterative Tau, um, using Spearman's row, method is uh, I row, which is an iterative row, and again display the results. So this is what the code looks like uh, in the file, and this is what the results look like. So this is quite nice because uh, it shows you that you do actually get different results depending on the approach that you use. So the alphas are fairly close, um, but they're a little bit smaller in particular for the maximum likelihood approach compared to the uh, Kendall's Tau or the Spearman's Row approach. It's also interesting to note that when you're doing this, the uh, maximum likelihood approach does take a little bit longer to run. And the reason for this is it's an iterative process. So as we saw, the uh, Kendall's Tower in particular is a method of moments approach, which is really simple. So it, it runs almost instantaneously. If you're doing maximum likelihood, because there's no closed form solution to this, you need to iterate um, your results. And that gives you a slightly different result, but also takes, takes longer to process. So let's leave it there for now. That's how you can fit Archimedean copulas, uh, which is a fairly simple thing to do in Excel as well, but it just shows you it's pretty much as simple to do in R once you've got the data loaded. Uh, next time we'll come back and we'll look at how you fit elliptical copulas and some of the other uh, things that you can do around the fitting process when you're looking at uh, elliptical copulas.